Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. Today we're looking at the final prices from the recent December uh, Rock Island auction. Uh, we'll kick it off with some sporting guns. This was a really, actually a really cool uh, old sporting Mauser made on a, an 1871 action with a double set trigger and a tang sight and a box magazine and a cartridge cutoff, all sorts of cool stuff added. Um, Honestly, I don't follow sporting rifle prices all that much, so I'm not sure how fair this price was. I'm sure the guy who bought it will be pretty happy with it. Uh, certainly more so than the guy who was trying to sell the 950 JDJ rifle. I think what we're seeing here, some of these, well, the two big rifles in particular that I looked at didn't do all that well in this auction. And what I think you see is the effect of uh, project rifles being kind of like project cars in that you, when you take on a project like that, you really have to accept that you're going to put a lot more money into something like this than someone else is going to be willing to pay for it. Um, the 950 didn't sell, which means it didn't hit reserve. I don't know what the reserve was. Uh, the double deuce was estimated at 15 to 25,000 and it brought 6,900, which means a, a bid of 6,000, um, which they took. There wasn't a reserve on that preventing it, but uh, I'm sure the owner is a bit disappointed by that. Uh, if it's any consolation to them, their pistol did a lot better. That that actually sold for more than it was estimated at. I think because at, at that price and at that size, that's a lot less of a uh, an emotional and physical investment than a 60-pound uh, two-bore rifle. So this is also um, a percussion gun, so you don't need cartridge cases. You can download it pretty easily. I think this would honestly be a lot more fun to have than the rifle. Uh, there was a whole, a whole substantial collection of Martz pistols at this particular auction. Uh, Martz being a, uh, a pretty well-known gunsmith who'd worked on Lugers and P-38s. And so they had an assortment of a couple of 45 caliber Martz Lugers. You know, if you want an authentic 45 Mauser Luger, you're going to pay like probably six figures for it. Uh, Martz gives you an option to get something that's really, really quite nicely made. Uh, functions the same way and for a small fraction of the price. Same with Baby Lugers. Uh, extremely rare to find original ones. Martz gives you the option of having some pretty cool uh, reproductions. And so uh, what we see here is these actually, pretty much all of these sold at or a little above what they were estimated at. Uh, people were pretty easily paying three to five grand for them and more in some cases, like the carbine here. Um, like I said, Martz did Lugers, and he then also worked on P-38s. So I had a number of P-38s in uh, in the video I did on them. There were a bunch more also in the auction. Um, the baby here went for basically five grand. Uh, and this is an example of a gun that does not exist in uh, in original form. The, the Germans never made a, a P-38 with a cut-down grip frame like this one. Then we also had a long-barreled, heavy uh, 45 caliber. P38, again, something that did not ever exist in original form, but John Martz, pretty talented gunsmith, he can make one, and he did make them. Uh, he is, by the way, unfortunately passed away now, so some of the pricing on these may reflect the fact that there will never be any more of them. Uh, and then lastly, he also made 38 Super Caliber P38s, which seems like a little bit of an unusual choice to me, but uh, clearly a couple of people wanted it, because it takes at least two people to drive the price up to $4,300. Uh, certainly is a gorgeously finished gun, uh, looks great, presumably shoots really well too. Uh, moving on to some of the antiques in the auction, we had a Lorenzoni musket. Uh, I say musket because it's rifle length, but smooth bore. This went for just under 10 grand. These are really cool actions. Um, and I, as you may have noticed, pretty much every time I find one, I do a video on it because they're all a little bit different. Um, this one was actually, for Lorenzoni, made rather late. Uh, almost uh, in 1800, in the late 1700s, uh, by a British gunmaker. We have a couple Confederate, <coughs> or uh, Civil War year guns, I'm sorry, not Confederate, uh, that were in this auction. This is a Burnside carbine, uh, the third most common carbine in U.S. service during the Civil War. And what drove the price on this one up, I'm sure, is the fact that it is in absolutely magnificent condition. Uh, this thing clearly has never been ridden around on the back of a horse. It's been taken well care of. And uh, just a great, great carbine. Uh, also a green carbine. Uh, these were tested by the U.S. This one is actually a British contract piece, as are actually the majority of them. Uh, and also in really quite excellent con uh, shape, excellent condition. The greens are the, have some pretty cool mechanical features to them as well. So I'm sure whoever got this one is also going to be quite happy with it. 
Now, uh, the Lindsay pistol, this was an American secondary martial pistol, meaning it was probably used in the Civil War, but never officially purchased by the US government. This one failed to sell. Um, I, I didn't watch the, uh, the sale on this one live, so I don't know what the bidding actually got to, but didn't sell generally means it didn't meet a reserve price. So uh, a lot of these guns did pretty well. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see where that would have sold if it hadn't been for the reserve. The Alsop, boy, I'm kind of on a roll here of really, really nice condition Civil War guns. The Alsop pocket revolver here was another great example. Um, while it is a bit scratched up, you can see this really magnificent bluing on this revolver, which really does look like this gun would have come out of the factory. So uh, that's, of course, what drove its price up. Condition always increases prices. Now, speaking of increased prices, this one kind of blew me away. When I saw the estimate, the estimate was something like fifteen to $22,000, and I really don't understand where that comes from. Maybe I'm missing something there, but it blew that away and sold for $31,500. It's a really cool little piece, but I did not anticipate that happening. I kind of expected this would be another one that wouldn't sell because its reserve would be too high, but nope, apparently someone really wanted it. Two people, in fact. Uh, same sort of goes for the, the Grad CM1. This thing is a pretty ludicrously ornate piece. I'm sure whoever buys it is not going to shoot it. They're going to put it in a case and put it on display somewhere. Uh, perhaps the Russian oligarch suite on a Soyuz capsule, but who knows? <laughs> Definitely a one-of-a-kind piece there. There were a pair of Japanese flare guns in the auction. I wanted to take a look at those because they're not particularly common and they're kind of pretty impressive looking guns and a little bit different than some of the other flare guns you'll see out there. So um, the Type 90, they made a two barrel and a three barrel. This is of course a three barrel version, went for 1600 bucks. Uh, seems pretty fair to me. Uh, there are people out there who are very interested in collecting specifically flare guns. There are some legal issues uh, in some jurisdictions that make flare guns a lot easier to collect than uh, proper firearms. Now, the Type 10, this was the Army uh, flare gun, as opposed to the, the 90 was a Navy flare gun. Uh, it uses a, actually a larger flare, a 35 millimeter flare, and this one didn't sell. So again, we're probably looking at a reserve that was a bit uh, too high. So always a, a pitfall if you're putting something up for auction, figure out what you're actually willing to take, and sometimes a reserve will prevent you from getting anything at all. The prototype uh, Steyr Solothurn Mauser here. This was a really cool, interesting gun. It took me a little while to try and dig up information on this, and I'm still not entirely sure I've got the whole story, but uh, pretty sure this was a, a trials prototype for the Hungarian military uh, in the early 1930s. Went for just under $2,900. Someone got a great addition to their collection with that. Uh, a Piat, the, the British uh, successor to the boys' anti-tank rifle. One thing to point out on this, uh, Rock Island was selling it as a papered NFA item, and I said that as well because I did actually see the NFA paperwork for it. I believe after the last time this was transferred, the Piat has actually been added to the exempt list of the NFA, so it should not require a tax uh, stamp to transfer. Uh, that's something that I'm sure Rock Island and the buyer will work out. Uh, the VB grenade launcher definitely doesn't require a tax stamp because it's just a clamp-on tube accessory. That went for four grand. Pretty cool. Um, I personally would love to have a French one of these, but it's uh, exactly the same design that the Americans used, in this case, on a 1917 Enfield rifle. A um, couple others. Let's see. We have the Navy M1 Garin. Went for 2300 Not a whole lot because... There's not, honestly, there's not a whole lot uh, historically distinctive. It's not like the Navy went out and fought some really notable battles with 7.62 NATO Garands, uh, but they were in service. Maybe actually more of them in service than a lot of people think. Regardless, it's a pretty cool rifle for someone who is collecting M1s. We had a couple bayonets that I took a look at. The Bolo bayonet brought a whole lot of money for a pitted and rough condition bayonet, but that is, of course, because they are so incredibly scarce. They did not make very many of them in the first place. The vast majority of them were literally used until they were junk uh, in the Philippines because they were actually an excellent piece of kit. Definitely uh, better regarded than, by many than the trowel bayonets. We have here an early 1869 trowel bayonet. This came from one of the original uh, series of trials on trowel bayonets. This of course, did not replace an entrenching tool. This became an entrenching tool. When these were issued, the US military didn't have any entrenching tools issued to the infantry. And so the idea of having one that would double as a bayonet 
maybe not the worst idea. Uh, the units who tried them out actually rather liked them, which led to the production of a much larger number of 1873 pattern ones with a better handle. This one was being sold with a trapdoor Springfield rifle, and I think whoever got this got a really quite good deal on it. Now, if you're interested in trowel bayonets, but you don't want to drop, uh, you know, 1800 bucks for one with a rifle, there are reproductions out there. You can find them on Gunbroker or eBay from time to time. I think probably the coolest thing that I looked at through the whole auction was this Cameron Yagi uh, trench rifle conversion of a 1903 Springfield. This thing is just absolutely downright awesome. Sold for a whole big pile of money, almost double what the estimate was. I'm sure the owner is quite happy with that, the previous owner, and I'm sure the new owner is also quite happy with it. Uh, they only made like a dozen of these things, and uh, I don't think more than one or two or maybe three still exist. As opposed to, well, here we go, the, the Air Service Springfield, uh, Othias at CNR Salonai had a, a little bit of a whoopsie on this. He found some really cool information on them after I had already filmed. So we have a, a couple videos on that, just tracking down exactly what was going on with these things. Uh, sold for a lot less than the trench rifle because, well, there's a lot less going on with an Air Service Springfield. Uh, we took a look at a Valmat. This is the closest you will get to a Finnish military pattern Valmat. Uh, the 62 with the early tube handle and the cheese grater forend. Extremely cool rifles. I'd love to have one myself, but I'm not in a position to spend $7,000 on one. Someone was. Honestly, this price doesn't strike me as all that outrageous. A little higher. I was expecting five to six. It went for seven. Pretty cool. It's a really nice example. And lastly, we had the selection of semi-auto Uzis from Action Arms. Uh, these went for $17.25 for both of the Model Bs, the one with the wood stock and the one with the folding stock, and just under two grand for the Model A. There's the I really found the story behind these to be a lot cooler than I was anticipating when I went in and actually started reading up on where the, the semi-auto Uzi story actually came from. Anyway, uh, we'll have another auction coming up in a month or two, so stay tuned, check that out, and thank you for watching.